What's going on all of my healthcare besties? Today we're going to be talking about how to interpret EKGs. Let's get started. So we're going to start by talking about the distinct segments you're going to see on an electrocardiogram. So we're going to start by talking about our isoelectric line, which is this black line that runs through our ECG. This line acts as a critical baseline, representing the moment when the heart's electrical activity shows no net movement, effectively a zero electrical potential state. This baseline is essential for interpreting the heart's electrical signals accurately, allowing healthcare professionals like you to distinguish between the various phases of the heart's activity, such as depolarization and repolarization cycles. It aids in identifying abnormalities in heart function by highlighting deviations from normal heart rhythm patterns, making it a fundamental aspect of ECG analysis. The first initial minor peak that you're going to see on your ECG is called the P wave. It then proceeds to our next prominent formation called our QRS complex. And it ultimately concludes at the next subsequent minor peak, which is known as our T wave. We're going to explore each of these in detail, starting with our P wave. The P wave is going to signify atrial depolarization, also known as atrial contraction. It's a phase where the two atria are ultimately going to contract together. And following that, we have the QRS complex, which is known as our ventricular depolarization, which is when our ventricles are going to contract together. Essentially, depolarization is just a fancy way of saying contraction. But how can we differentiate between the two? Well, the P wave is linked to the atrial activity, while the QRS complex relates to our ventricular activity. A helpful hint if you're getting confused between the two, the QRS complex represents an inverted V with the V representing our ventricles. And lastly, we have the T wave. So the T wave is going to represent ventricular repolarization. This is marking the period where the ventricles are beginning their process of relaxing. It's essential to remember that each depolarization phase, which leads to contraction, is invariably followed by a repolarization phase allowing for relaxation. So this always brings up an intriguing question. Where does the atrial repolarization occur? If the QRS complex is associated with ventricular depolarization and the T wave is associated with ventricular repolarization, then atrial repolarization must occur somewhere between that, right? Indeed, atrial repolarization happens concurrently within the time frame of the QRS complex. The QRS complex being a pronounced structure overshadows atrial repolarization. And this is because the ventricles contract with much more force than we see with the atria, effectively concealing that atrial repolarization signal. Therefore, atrial repolarization leading to the atria's relaxation occurs following the P wave, but is encompassed inside the span of our QRS complex. Next, let's talk about segments and intervals. Located between our P wave and the QRS complex, we have the PR segment, which illustrates the delay introduced by the AV node. This delay orchestrated by the AV node's role as the gatekeeper, allowing the atria sufficient time to transfer blood into the ventricles before those ventricles begin to contract. Within the same region, we can identify the PR interval, which is a critical measurement at the start of the onset of our P wave, and it continues up until the start of our QRS complex. Understanding and measuring the PR interval is vital when we're diagnosing conditions like heart blocks. Next, we have the ST segment, and this marks the end of ventricular depolarization and the onset of ventricular repolarization. It is expected to be flat like in its appearance here, reflecting its isoelectric nature. This means it should appear as a straight line without any upward or downward deviations. Evaluating the ST segment is crucial because deviations from that expected flat line is going to show potentially some cardiac conditions like ischemia, as well as myocardial infarctions, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. So the QT interval that we see here spans from the onset of our QRS complex to the end of our T wave, representing the duration required for the ventricles to both contract and subsequently relax in response to electrical signals. This represents an 
ideal ECG waveform as described in your textbooks. Yet it's important to delve into any kind of potential issues that we could see with these waveforms, segments, and intervals that we might encounter. So we're gonna start with P wave abnormalities such as peaking, notching, and inversion. They provide valuable insights on the atria's health as well as the function. So anytime we see this kind of peaking that takes place with our atria, we're looking most likely at right atrial enlargement. This is typically a result of conditions that impose increased pressure or strain on that right atrium, such as things like pulmonary hypertension. We can also see this notched kind of formation when it comes to our P wave. This is sometimes referred to as biphasic P waves, and this can indicate left atrial enlargement, pointing to issues with the mitral valve, maybe that's disease, or we could even see hypertension that's ultimately going to affect the left side of the heart. And lastly, we may even see an inverted P wave kind of scenario. And whenever we're looking at inverted P waves, we're most likely looking at junctional rhythms. So ST segment abnormalities, specifically we're looking at either depression of that ST segment or we're looking at elevation of that ST segment. And it's critical indicators because either we have some kind of ischemia or we have some kind of infarction taking place in the heart. So an elevated ST segment is a hallmark sign whenever we're looking at an acute myocardial infarction also known as an MI, suggesting that a portion of the heart muscle is actively undergoing damage due to a lack of blood supply. Anytime we see these kind of changes to the ST segment, especially elevation, we have to give that patient immediate medical attention to restore the blood flow and hopefully minimize the damage that the heart is taking. So in contrast, an ST depression like we see here often indicates that we have myocardial ischemia taking place, which although not as immediately life-threatening as we see with an MI, still signifies that the heart muscle is not receiving sufficient oxygen. Oxygen. Ultimately, both conditions are serious and necessitate prompt evaluation and management to prevent further cardiac complications. Lastly, let's talk about deviations when it comes to our T wave. They can either be tall, inverted, or hyperacute. So anytime we see tall T waves or peaked T waves like we have here, we're most likely looking at some kind of hyperkalemia, which is an elevated potassium levels that could ultimately affect the cardiac conduction. There are also some reasons why we might see an inverted T wave. Sometimes a normal variant can also signify myocardial ischemia ischemia, previous myocardial infarction, or pericarditis, reflecting changes in myocardial repolarization. And lastly, we have hyperacute T waves where they're really, really high, really, really peaked, characterized by a broad base and peaked appearance. Maybe early indicators of some kind of acute myocardial infarction taking place, signaling the initial stages of cardiac injury. So let's take a closer look at our ECG graph paper. So this is what you're going to see on a standard ECG strip. Each strip is divided into large squares as signaled by these darker lines that you see here on your strip. And with each large square, it's going to contain five smaller boxes. So starting with our little purple box that we see right here, one tiny little square, one small square is equal to 0.04 seconds. Since we know that large squares are comprised of five of these small squares, a single large square, which we have represented right here in green, represents a total of 0.20 seconds. And expanding on this by understanding that five large squares are going to amount by one second. So as you can see here, we have five large squares in blue, five times 0 0.20 is going to give us one second. And this is ultimately gonna help us with the timing of cardiac events accurately. Furthermore, whenever we say that we're looking at a six second strip, we're ultimately referring to a strip that has 30 large boxes. As you know, 
30 large boxes multiplied by 0 0.20 is ultimately going to give us six seconds. So whenever we're looking at rhythms that are considered irregular, we can multiply the amount of R waves that we see across that entire six second strip by 10 to give us our full heart rate for a minute. This systemic layout is crucial for accurately measuring and timing the duration of various cardiac events, as well as identifying any potential abnormalities in our heart's rhythm. So let's talk about how we are going to identify our ECG rhythms. So here's the six step process that we are going to follow. So we're gonna start with step one, and we're gonna identify whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. Step two, we're gonna determine the heart rate to see if it falls either in our SA node, our AV node, or our Purkinje fibers. Step three, we're going to examine the P wave. We wanna make sure that we have a P wave before every QRS complex, and it has that nice upright shape. Step four, we wanna measure the PR interval and the QRS complex to make sure that these are within normal. As you know, a PR interval should be between 0.12 to 0.2 seconds, and our QRS complex should be narrow and normal, less than 0.12. Step five, we wanna look for anything that doesn't seem right. Do we have any early beats, missing beats, maybe beats that look a little bit different from the rest? And then once we have all of this information available to us, we are gonna to go to step six and we're going to interpret what that rhythm is. So starting with step one, we want to assess whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. We determine this by measuring the spacing between our consecutive R waves. I always recommend using calipers for precision, but a simple alternative method is you can also use an index card. So what you wanna do is you want to mark the distance between two R waves when you're measuring on your six second strip. As you're measuring down your strip, we call this marching out, these little marks should always fall in the exact same place every single time with each R wave. If that distance does match, it indicates that we have a regular rhythm. If the distance varies, that means that the rhythm is going to be called irregular. So as you can see here on our six second strip, if I was to measure all of these R waves, using that little method, it should come out the same every single time. We call this marching out. And we would name this a regular rhythm because the spacing in between these R waves are always going to fall uniformly. However, if we were to look at a rhythm like this, this is an irregular rhythm. Because if I was to march out and measure in between all of these R waves, they're not gonna fall the same every single time as you can see on your screen. Some are shorter, some are longer. They're just not gonna be uniform. So we would call this an irregular rhythm. So step two involves determining our heart rate. Before proceeding, it's crucial to make sure that we have a six second strip. Nursing schools, as well as sometimes when you're in the healthcare profession, you're not always given the whole strip. So it can skew your heart rate depending on how long or how short that strip is. A key way to indicate if we have a six second strip is to look for these little markers at the top of your ECG strip. Spotting these lines indicate that we are gonna have 10 large boxes in between each marker line. You want to make sure that you have a total of 30 large boxes across in order to signify that you have a complete second strip. I wanna make a quick disclaimer regarding the strips that you're gonna see in the ECG video series, as many of them are not going to have 30 large boxes. But for educational purposes, we are going to assume that every strip we see is a six second strip. So to determine heart rate for regular rhythms, we wanna count the amount of small boxes in between two consecutive R waves and then divide that total number by 1500. So if we look here, we have one large box, two large box, three large boxes in between our R waves. So we take 1500 and we divide that by 15 and that is going to give us our total heart rate of 100 beats per minute. Next, we wanna determine heart rates for irregular rhythms. This process involves counting the number of R waves within our six second strip and then multiplying that by 10. So if we were to count our R waves, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We would take that number of R waves, we're gonna multiply it by 10, and that's ultimately going to give us our heart rate of 120 beats per minute. So step three is the process of identifying and scrutinizing our P waves. 
Under normal conditions, our P wave should be visible and upright like we see here at the bottom of your screen. Whenever we have an absence, inversion, retrograde, or short P wave, it might suggest that we're looking at a junctional rhythm, indicating there's some kind of irregularity taking place in the heart's electrical activity. Next, let's assess the PR interval, which spans from the start of our P wave until the start of our QRS complex. This is achieved by tallying the small boxes between these two points and multiplying that by 0.04 seconds. A normal PR interval should be between 0.12 and 0.2 seconds. If we have a PR interval that's going to exceed that 0.2 seconds, it may signal some kind of dysrhythmia, such as a first degree heart block, highlighting potential disruptions in the heart's electrical conduction system. Next up, we want to evaluate our QRS complex, and this involves the similar approach that we saw with our PR interval, which is we're going to count the number of small boxes from the start of our QRS complex to the end of our S wave. The ideal QRS duration should be between 0.06 and 0.12 seconds. I usually always ask myself whenever I'm looking at QRS complexes, are they narrow and normal or are they big, wide and ugly? If we have a QRS complex that is big, wide and ugly, meaning that it's greater than 0.12 seconds, the rhythm is always going to have either bundle branch or ventricular in the name. We're gonna discuss this more when we get into our ventricular rhythms, but keep that in the back of your mind. Step five includes early beats, missing beats, or beats that just appear a little bit different from the rest. So anytime we're looking at early beats, we're most likely looking at premature contractions. They can originate from the atria, meaning that they are a premature atrial contraction. They can come from the junction, meaning that they're a premature junctional contraction, or they can originate from the ventricles, meaning they would be a premature ventricular contraction. Anytime we're looking at some kind of missing beat or pauses, it can suggest that we're looking at a delay or block in the heart's electrical system, potentially pointing to an atrial ventricular block or even a sinus arrest, where the heart skips a beat or more due to the disruption of the heart's rhythm. And anytime we see beats that just look a little bit different from the rest, this could signify that we have some kind of arrhythmia taking place, like atrial fibrillation, where the P waves are absent and replaced by these kind of fibrillation waves, or we could even be looking at ventricular tachycardia, characterized by big, wide, and ugly QRS complexes. Each of these patterns are ultimately going to provide us with vital clues of underlying heart conditions, requiring careful evaluation to determine the appropriate management and treatment options. And then our final step, step six, we're going to interpret the rhythm. We could either be looking at a sinus rhythm, an atrial rhythm, a junctional rhythm, ventricular rhythm, lethal rhythm, heart blocks, or we could even have a patient that has a pacemaker. So stay tuned, those videos are gonna be coming to help you identify those individual rhythms. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding how we interpret ECG rhythms. Hang tight because we have more videos coming where we are going to outline everything you're going to need to know for each individual rhythm that we talked about. If you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechungstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources to help you ace these ECG rhythms. And as always, I'm going to catch you in the next video. Bye!